start. So hello, the topic of today is topography of the pelvis and topography of the neck. And uh, this is how the pelvis looks like if you, if you open it and uh, you remove the intestine, the large intestine. So you can see the greater pelvis and lesser pelvis now without uh, the large and small intestine. And we see only the major organs of uh, lesser pelvis here, which is the, the urinary bladder here with uh, median umbilical ligament towards umbilicus, flipped, and uh, uterus with cut uterine tubes and uh, round ligaments of uterus also flipped, and then the position of rectus, uh, of rectum, sorry, the positions of rectum. You can see that urinary bladder and uterus are covered with peritoneum, but the peritoneum is taken away from uh, the upper part of rectum. And of course, you can see all the important vessels and nerves here, so I will mark some of them. External iliac vessels and lymph nodes and genitofemoral nerve which are at the border of the lesser pelvis and greater pelvis. And then in lesser pelvis, the obturator nerve and below the artery, uh, umbilical artery and below the obturator artery and below the obturator vein. And if you go a bit distally, we just see the obturator nerve artery and vein entering the obturator canal here. Yeah. So these are the vessels which are uh, parallel to uh, the linea terminalis running here and separating these two pelvises. And then of course internal iliac vessels behind uh, the sacral plexus branches. And don't forget about uh, ureter descending here and the cut, in this case ovarian vessels or the gonadal ones. Very dorsally, we find the sacral median vessels. So now you are a bit inside the pelvis and we can start uh, repeating the major things. I don't repeat all the details. I just want to stress what you should concentrate on and what you should study then. So we have here uh, the openings and the ligaments. So here we can find two openings which are de uh, defined by two ligaments in sacrotuberose and sacrospinos. Yeah? So we have ligamentum sacrospinale, sacrospinos is this one. And then the other sacrotuberose, ligamentum sacro Berala is the other one, yeah? And they define these two openings. And that's on the greater sciatic foramen and the lesser sciatic foramen, yeah? Into the greater one, we can insert a piriformis muscle. Yes, and then we can divide it into a um, better different color. Ah, I'm sorry, undo. And no, like that. Supra piriform for a man and infrapiriform foramen. So we have three openings. And of course, the fourth opening is here, which is the obturator foramen, closed with membrane and only a small 
area, which is obturator canal, canal is obturator is left. Okay, so these are openings which transmit vessels out from the lesser pelvis yeah, to the lower limb. Okay, now we put muscles into the bony skeleton and we can see this muscle, which is a levator ani, the largest. Then we have a smaller one, that's ischiococcygeus. And of course, the third muscle is not drawn here. It's uh, based on the same innervation. And the innervation comes mainly from S4, but also a bit from S3 segments of the spinal cord and they travel via pudendal nerve and the anterior branch of the fourth sacral nerve. Yeah, so these three muscles form altogether muscles of the pelvic floor. And you can see that they are not uh, inserted or attached to the bony rim here but they are a bit shifted down. So you can see here part of the internal obturator muscle here, yeah, the canal. And the structure which is shown here and serves for the origin of the iliococcygeal muscle is shown here. That's this structure. Yeah. And we call this structure Tendinous arch, arcus tendinous, musculi leva, oris ani, yeah? tendinous arch of the levator ani muscle. So that's the origin for the iliococcygeal muscle. On this slide, we can see also uh, another muscle, and that's the ischiococcygeal one. So ischiococcygeal is this one. And we find it, we find it in the same uh, extent as the sacrospinous ligament. Sacrospinous ligament is externally, and the ischiococcygeal muscle is internally. Ah, on this view, we can see the tendinous arch of the levator and muscle nicely. Yeah. So this is obturator muscle, periformis muscle. Uh, this is ischiococcygeal muscle, ileo, iliococcygeal muscle, and pubococcygeal muscle. And you can see that the iliococcygeal originates from the tendinous arch. And the tendinous arch is shown here as well. And we can see the other part of the muscle now. So we have a puboprostatic in males or pubovaginal in females. Yeah, that's the shortest part, which, uh, which is located also most medially. Then we have puboperineal part, which goes into the perineum located here and then we have the puboanal and puborectal which are two parts one above the other and they go to the rectum so you can we can see it like this yeah. of course iliococcygeal is then this triangular shaped one so if we come to such a scheme. The scheme nicely shows you all the parts of the muscle. So we can see the parts which starts from the pubic bone, which is pubococcygeal and it's a part puboperineal, puboprostatic or pubovaginal depending on the gender and puboanal, which inserts into the wall of the rectum together with the puborectal muscle yeah 
these two. One of them is uh, inserted just directly into the wall and the other makes such a, such a crossing here, so goes to the opposite side. But the puborectal is the most important one, which makes such a sling around and keeps the position of flexed rectum during, uh, uh, during continence. Yeah? And then the iliac oxygel and ischiac oxygel as shown by violet and yellow color respectively. So all these muscles uh, form the floor which keeps the organs. Here we can see the angle. Yeah, this is the angle formed by the puborectal muscle important for the continence of the stool. Okay, some more views and the presentation is full of different uh, views for your homework. But if we look from below, now we can see the pelvic floor, which is in the anterior two fifth covered by muscles of the urogital floor or so-called perineal muscles. So we cannot see them from the inferior point of view. We just see uh, the other parts, which can be divided into the pubococcygeal and puborectal here, and the iliococcygeal here, and the ischiococcygeal here. And the whole space, which is visible here, we call ischioanal fossa. And the ischioanal fossa, I'm sorry, the ischioanal fossa is this one. And this is so called anterior better the ischioanal fossa goes like this so-called anterior or pubic recess, anterior pubic recess. Yeah, you can enter it through this opening here. And we'll come to this recess soon. So, uh, again, look from the inferior point of view and except for muscles, what is important for us are other structures. And they are quite similar as for the shape in male and female. So here you can see the prostate and on the other side you can see vagina and urethra. And so they cover just the anterior one third and the structure which is behind located is called perineum. Yeah, so this is perineum both in both, uh, both genders. As for the last muscle, that's the external anal sphincter. It is necessary to highlight that it has got three parts, deep, superficial, and subcutaneous parts. And they are in continuation with the rectal muscle wall, which is smooth, and with the puborectal muscle, which is part of the pelvic floor muscles. Yeah. So this is the sphincter ani externus muscle. And we can see to which structures it is attached. Yeah. So from pubic symphysis, we have the puborectalis making the sling. Yeah. That's the puborectalis muscle. And then the three layers of the external anal sphincter, the subcutaneous one, which is really uh, inserted into the skin. The superficial one, which is inserted to the bone, and this inserted to the coccyx via anocoxygeal raffae, and it is uh, inserted to perineal body, and the perineal body is fixed to pubic symphysis by the perineal muscles. We are going to talk about it in a minute. And then the deep part, which is again freestanding structure. Yeah? So the superficial part is the part which is fixed to the surrounding structures. And now we can move from 
the pelvic floor to the perineal muscles or lulgental floor. Just here we can see the ischioanal fossa opened with the pubic recess or anterior recess and a closed, yeah? So here, if we have the perineal muscles here, we can see how the pubic recess is closed and this is the entrance into the pubic recess. Okay, now view from above, we just can see uh, the urogenit, uh, the pelvic floor here, and the obturator and a piriformis. And from below, we can see the pelvic floor here, and the piriformis, and from below, we can see in the anterior to fifth also the muscles of the urogenital floor. So what is the urogenital floor? We call them also perineal muscles. And they are four muscles in one plane, in one level. They make the floor. And then three sphincters in female or one sphincter in male, which are located above. Yeah, they are located above and they are surrounding urethra. The innervation comes from S4, and all the muscles finally insert into the center, which is called perineal body. If you look at the figure, the perineal body is located here, and the muscles are two muscles attached to the cavernous bodies, which is ischio cavernous, inserted into cavernous bodies, and uh, bulbospongios inserted into the spongios body, sporgy body, which is also a cavernous body of penis. And then another two muscles, they are called perineal, as they insert to the perineal body. And that's the deep and superficial one. Yeah? So all together they form such a triangle. And these four forms the floor. And above the floor is located the sphincter. We could not see it because we look from below, so it is not visible from this point of view. In female, we have, of course, the same muscles for clitoris here, so ischiocavernose muscle and the bulbospongios. The bulbospongios covers the uh, bulbus vestibuli. Bulbus vestibuli, the vestibule bulb, is a erectile body which is located here. Yeah. So we have these two muscles, and then we have the superficial transverse perineal muscle. And what is different, this area where the male has got uh, the male has got here the deep transverse perineal muscle. The female has got here something which is called perineal membrane. And they are not perineal. And perineal membrane is Fibros muscular plate, yeah, fibrous muscular plate. So it's it's more fibrous than, than muscle fibers, uh, and uh, that's why it is not considered as muscle itself. So that, that's why there is only three muscles in female usually, and then above it. We have three sphincters, only one in male, and the same in female, which is surrounded. Then below, it's oval uterovaginal sphincter. So we have two sphincters, yeah, round sphincter of urethra and oval sphincter of urethra vaginal. And in between, we have this horseshoe-shaped compressor. Okay, so this one is horseshoe-shaped. 
for RQA, this one is round, and this one is oval. So, oval like this. And uh, we can see them on this slide as well, nicely showing the round sphincter and sphincter of urethra, oval urethrovaginal sphincter and arcuate or horseshoe shaped compressor. Yeah. And the muscle then the muscles are located here, but they are located above this, so we cannot see them from the inferior point of view. Here on the section of uh, male, we can see the sphincter, because in male we have only one sphincter, the external sphincter. Yeah. And here we can see how the sphincter is, is quite large in young ones, but if the prostate starts to grow, and we can see how it's reused, and how it gets smaller, relatively small. Okay, all the muscles, as I said, are connected somehow to uh, the perineal body. The perineal body is the toughest part here, and it's located uh, before anus and behind urogenital hiatus. And up here, it, it forms such a pyramid shaped or cone shaped. Uh, structure and from above we can find here the Douglas pouch. So this perineal body or sometimes called perineal wedge then continues a so-called rectovaginal septum or rectovaginal fascia. Yeah? So it's quite tough, quite stiff caudally and the more cranial you go, it's uh, thinner and finer. And finally, it touches here the Douglas pouch. Okay, what you can see here is an opening which is located ventrally to the perineal membrane. Yeah. And ventrally to the perineal membrane is a space where a vein can pass. And we have a vein here on the dorsum of the penis and clitoris. And it goes here and up. So it passes through this space. And we call this vein uh, deep, or in, in Latin, vena dorsa penis. Or clitoridis profunda as the deep one. Yeah. And this is a special vein as it passes not only here up, but it also continues here to uh, internal pudendal vein. And if it goes up, it goes into pudendal plexus. So it's a vein which is which bifurcates. Yeah, and we don't have many veins which bifurcates. We have only two such other veins. It's a portal vein in liver, which bifurcates into right and left branch. And we have a retromandibular vein, which bifurcates into anterior and posterior division. Yeah. So the, this is this small space. It's an innominate space, so no special name for it. Yeah, and we find it here. Before, um, anterior to this, this plate. And this plate is in male called the deep transverse perineal muscles. And in female, as I said, it's fibromuscular tissue, so we call it a perineal membrane. Yeah? So that's the difference between these two uh, genders. Okay. So here, just pay attention to 
uh, the shape of the external genital organs. So crura of clitoris are quite long. They are, they are thin, but they are quite long. But then there is a big angle between the crus and the body and the small body and glands. Yeah, in male, you can see the crus is also long, it's bigger, but then the angle is quite obtuse here. Yeah. The other structure is a uh, vestibular bulb connected by a commissure to the other side. Uh, in male, we have a bulb of penis, which forms the spongy body of the penis. Yeah. So the whole structure which you can see here is the urogenital floor. And this arrow nicely shows you how you can get between the two floors. Yeah, in here, into the anterior recess of the ischional fossa, which is behind. So behind is the ischional fossa, and this is the anterior recess. And there's a question. So there is no deep transverse muscle in female? No, there is no deep transverse muscle in female. There is only a membrane there with some muscle fibers. Okay. So now we can move to topography. And we can see here the pelvic outlet or apertura pelvis inferior. Uh, and uh, we can see that uh, the aperture, uh, the inferior aperture or the outlet is not one plane. It's formed by two triangles. Yeah, the anterior triangle goes from pubic symphysis towards uh, sciatic tuberosity. And the posterior one goes from sciatic tuberosity dorsally to the apex of uh, sacral bone and coccygeal bone. Yeah, so you have two triangles. The posterior is called anal triangle and the anterior is called urogenital triangle. And the urogenital triangle is covered with the perineal muscles or the urogenital floor. Yeah, so that's this area. So if you look into the original triangle, what we can see, just the structures which we already know. This is a female. So in female, we have a slim uh, cruise of clitoris, then the sharp angle, the body of the clitoris, and the glands, then the vestibular bulb with commissure to the other side. And it's covered by two muscles, yeah? the bulbospongios, and the ischial cavernos. In here we can find thin superficial transverse muscle and in between is something which is called, not fascia, but uh, membrana, yeah? membrana perinei. Don't forget about the structure which is called uh, uh, greater vestibular gland of Bartolini, yeah? So this is the female one. If we take a uh, uh, quite real specimen and draw it, what is important here is this area of the pudendal Olcox canal. And we can see how the internal pudendal vessels and the pudendal nerve uh, comes here and gives some branches. Yeah, some that you can see that the canal is running like this, but it gives branches all the way. It's not like a canal without any any opening, but it has got openings in the medial wall and giving branches. Like for example, perineal branches here, and to vagina branches here, and inferior rectal branches here. So that's very important to to realize that you are not, you cannot cut this area easily. Otherwise, you will harm the vessels and nerves running in an oblique way. 
in uh, mail. Here is the cruise, which is a bit larger and continues into the body, yeah, which is here. There is the bulb, which continues as the spongy unpaired one. So the bulb is of course unpaired, but I just showed it on one side as it's covered then by the bulbospongiose muscle and here with the ischiocavernous muscle. Then we have the superficial perineal muscle and we have the deep perineal muscle. Yeah? So that's the floor in male. This is similar, yeah. And now we come to the ischial fossa again to define it. So, for each structure, for each topographical space, you should know the boundaries. You remember that, for example, from uh, carpal tunnel, the most famous one. So we have ventrally the retinaculum flexorum, dorsally we have the bones the carpal bones and medial and laterally we have the eminences, medial and lateral eminence. So in here the boundaries, you can draw the boundaries. So cranially and mediocranially, you have the pelvic floor covered with the fascia. So that's this, yeah. And of course, sphincter, external and now sphincter. Laterally, we have the obturator fascia with the obturator muscle and the sciatic tuberosity. Dorsally, that means behind we have the sacrotuberous ligament and uh, gluteus maximus muscle. And caudally is just the superficial perineal fascia or membranous, uh, membranous layer of the subcutaneous tissue, stratum membranous. And now the space in between is ischial and alpha. So, yeah. In the lateral wall, we have the duplication of the fascia and we can find the artery, vein and nerve, so the internal pudendal vessels and pudendal nerve running in the pudendal Olcox canal. Majority is filled with adipose tissue making such big lobules, but they are separated by some septi. The septi are derived from obturator fascia here. Yeah. What is the clinical significance of whole this? The clinical significance is that we can have here an abscess, that means a collection of infected fluid which can get its wall, it can spread to the other side or it can spread ventrally or dorsally. Yeah, It does not spread here because there's the fascia, it does not spread here does not spread here, yeah, no, no, and no. So that's why you should know the border so you know where you can uh, expect uh, the inflammation to spread. So there are questions, is there good confirmation from the recess? Yes, that uh, in, uh, if you look at the recess, this is the recess, which is then, bordered by the pelvic floor, mediocranially, obturator muscle, internal obturator muscle laterally, and perineal membrane, caudally. Yeah? And if you look from above, it looks like this one and the other. And dorsally is the ischial fossa, so this is the recess, that's the fossa. And you can see that the left and right are not connected in the midline, but the fossa is connected dorsally behind rectum. So then the inflammation can, can spread here, can spread here, but it here stops. Yeah, the same it can spread here, but it does not cross midline ventrally, but it crosses midline dorsally. 
Will you be posting this if you mean the presentation it's already posted? And if you mean uh, if you mean the session, every session is posted on the YouTube channel. Okay. So how to then uh, get uh, into the Pudendal kennel of Alcock? You can get there easily. You can see the kennel and you know that the contents is internal Pudendal vessels and nerve. And you know that they are also part of the infrapiriform foramen as they come from lesser pelvis out to the gluteal region. They go around the spinal, yeah, around the ischial spine, spina ischiatica, and they enter the uh, lesser sciatic notch or foramen, and they continue into Alcox canal. Yeah? So quite complicated way how the internal pudendal vessels and the pudendal nerve gets in. So, and this is classical section showing you uh, the ischioanal fossa and the pudendal canal on the side. Yeah, this is a section at the level of rectum. If it is a section at the level of, uh, for example, in female vagina, then here we will have the urogenital floor, the perineal muscles, and this won't be ischial fossa itself, but only its anterior or pubic recess. This figure shows you how uh, the pudendal nerve is formed from C2 to C4 roots, goes uh, through uh, Infrapiriform process around the spine yeah, to a lesser sciatic foramen and then into Puden uh, Alcox kennel. And you can see the major branches perineal nerve, inferior rectal nerves, posterior scrotal nerves, and the terminal branches dorsal nerves of penis or clitoris. And again, here we can see this is the extent of the pudendal canal, and you can see the main branches. So the inferior uh, rectal branches, the perineal branches, and the continuation is the dorsal uh, nerve of penis or clitoris. The same is for vessels, of course. Okay, so that was the uh, the inferior part with two floors. Now you put inside the organs and you've got here some spaces and some fascia and peritoneum. So how we call this space? This is spatium pubicum of retius. Yeah, so the, that's the retius space. So that's a space which is, which is filled with uh, the pudendal, sorry, uh, pudendal plexus of Santorini here in caudal part, and in the upper part, it just lose connective tissue here. Yeah. So then the uh, urinary bladder can extend here. Unlike this space, which is not a real space, here is the perineal body, so corpus perineale, yeah, that's here. And what is above? reaching the Douglas or Proust space, in, in this case, the Proust space, yeah, in female, the Douglas space, it is called fascia or septum. And depending on the 
recto vesicalis or in female uh, recto vaginalis. Yeah? So that's not a real space itself because it's filled with uh, connective tissue yeah? and not so, not so loose connective tissue here. So there's the differences in here. And of course the same for, for female. Okay, now here you have some, some figures for vessels and nerves, just to repeat it yourself, that's, that's a repetition. And another structure which is here. If we come back to see, come back here, we can see the peritoneum as the peritoneum makes some flexures, yeah. So in female and in male, there are some excavations. In male, it's rectovesical pouch. In female, we have a vesicouterine and a rectouterine pouch. But of course, we have some pouches here on the side, which we call para vesical and para rectal pouches. Yeah, para vesical here, uh, which is in front of uh, the broad ligament and here on the side by rectal, which is behind the broad ligament. So peritoneum is from above. And the peritoneum fo forms the broad ligament and the broad ligament has got mesometrium, yeah, which is this one, covering the womb. And then we have the mesosalpings covering the fallopian tube or the uterine tube. And we have the mesovary covering the ovary. Don't forget that on the ovary we have a simple cuboid epithelium, unlike the other parts which are just lined with simple squamous epithelium. Yeah? Okay. What is then below? When we have to talk about the broad ligament, what is here? This we call parametrium. And the parametrial ligaments then, you may know as, uh, the, for example, cardinal ligaments or transverse ligaments of, of cervix, yeah? So you can see that uh, if it's covered from both sides by uh, peritoneum, we call it perimetrium, yeah? That's the mesometrium, mesovarium, mesosalpings. If we get out from the peritoneum, and we are located subperitoneally, we already call it parametrium, yeah? And of course, when it goes down to the level of uh, vagina, we call it paracolpium, and if we go dorsally, we call it para, para proctium, yeah, which is around uh, rectum, and para cystium, we call it when it's around uh, urinary bladder. So this is subperitoneal connective tissue. So we have now talked about all the structures. So now we can concentrate on the section itself. So we have here some, uh, some fascia. As you can see here is fascia and here is fascia covering the pelvic floor, yeah? The superior fascia is part of the lesser pelvis, the inferior Fascia it already belongs to, and this is pubic recess of ischioanal fossa. Yeah, so you can find it here, the inferior uh, fascia of the pelvic floor. Then another structure is this, and we have female, so this is a perineal membrane, which is more fibrous than muscular. 
and that's why there is no fascia covering it. Yeah, when it's a fibro structure and you have a fascia on a fibro structure, both is a fibro structure, so you cannot distinguish it. So we have the perineal membrane, and we do not use these old names like fascia diaphragmatis of the urogenital floor. Then we have a fascia which covers the muscles of the erectile bodies. And we call it perineal fascia, or an old name is deep perineal fascia. And then finally, we have this structure, which is, which used to be called superficial, superficial uh, fascia, perineal fascia of coals. And now it's called the membranous layer of subcutaneous tissue. And you can uh, recall this, the scarpus fascia, which is also the membranous layer of the subcutaneous tissue on the abdomen, yeah? So it's derived from that, it's a continuation of this. So we have such four layers, and in between these layers, we have spaces. So you can see the spaces, and we have already talked about the pubic recess here. So that's the pubic recess of the ischial fossa. Then we have, on the other hand, subcutaneous sac, which is here. And then another space between the coals, superficial fascia, and the gallowed deep fascia, which we call superficial compartment. And then the most complicated is the deep compartment. And the deep compartment is this. Oh, sorry. Is this. Is the perineal membrane itself and the three sphincters in female, yeah? the sphincter urethra and sphincter urethra vaginalis and in between the compressor urethra. That's the deep space itself. So the deep space is just filled with muscles. The other spaces are filled with other structures. The subcutaneous and the pubic recess, they are filled with adipose tissue. And the superficial one is filled with mainly the muscles and erectile bodies. Yes? And if we combine it, this is the way how you will approach it during operations. So you go through the skin into the uh, spaces here. So you have, you have got the coals, uh, superficial fascia, then you go through the deep fascia, you get into the perineal membrane, into uh, pubic recess, and then into the pelvic floor and then inside the cavity of lesser pelvis. Yeah? So this is the way how you should approach it. Okay. Then we should define that we have some ligaments. As you know, ligaments are very tight, dense connective tissue structures in joints. But we can find ligaments also, for example, here. Yeah? Transverse cervical ligament, uterosacral ligament, pubovesical ligament. But these ligaments are not true ligaments. They are just fibro bands. Yeah? They are just condensed connective tissue, but they are not so firm as the joint ligaments, yeah? But they are there, they exist there, and we should know about them. And I think you all know these because they form the suspension apparatus of uterus, yeah? Together with the round ligament, which runs like this out through the inguinal canal. So do not forget that these ligaments are just fibrous bands. And we can see some of these again here, yeah, pubo ligaments, 
cardinal ligaments, uh, intersacral ligaments. And we have here another structure which is very important and it's called a tendinous arch of pelvic fascia. It's not the tendinous arch of levator ani, it's a tendinous arch of pelvic fascia. So we have to explain it. Yeah. Okay, here we have a tendinous arch, but this is a tendinous arch of levator ani muscle and it serves for attachment of mainly iliocoxygeal muscle. Yeah, so that's one tendinous arch. It's just a tendinous line or a very thin band. But then we have a tendinous arch of pelvic fascia. And what is it? When I come to this, I just have to explain that we have two kinds of fascia. We have the parietal and visceral. And we know the parietal, it, it uh, lines uh, all the cavities. So we have thoracic parietal, abdominal parietal, we have pelvic parietal. Yeah? It, or it's called endo, endothoracic, endoabdominal, endopelvic fascia. And it, of course, has some subparts. Uh, in abdomen, for example, transversalis fascia covering the transversus abdominis psoatic fascia, iliac fascia covering the homonymous muscle, anterior layer of thoracolumbar fascia covering quadratus lumborum. Yeah? So it can have some parts. If we come to pelvis, it covers the uh, internal obturator muscle, obturator fascia. It covers the pelvic floor from above, superior fascia of pelvic floor. It covers the sacrum. Sometimes it's called presacral fascia. Yeah? It is not uh, an official term, but it, you can you can find this term. And then from this parietal fascia, which is on the wall, there are uh, there is connective tissue covering vessels and nerves and all these fibrous bands approaching the organs. And this we call a visceral fascia. Yeah? It covers the organs, but it also covers the roots of the organs, the vessels and nerves, and the condensed tissue. And as we have three uh, organs, we have urinary bladder, we have urethra, uh, sorry, uterus and vagina, and rectum. So we have three layers or lamina, or in English, they are called pillars. And these pillars approaches the organs and cover them. Yeah. If you look in a, to a figure, you can see it here. That's the wall and the organs. So urinary bladder, uterus and vagina and rectum. And imagine the branches, for example. So internal iliac artery gives some inferior vesical artery, uterine artery, for example, here, middle rectal artery. And they, together with the nerves and veins, are covered with the fascia. This is parietal fascia, and this is visceral fascia. Yeah. Anterior layer, post-middle layer, and posterior layer. And again, parietal fascia. And again, visceral fascia, posterior layer, and middle layer, and anterior layer. And then again, parietal fascia. Yeah? So this is visceral fascia, its base or root, and it has got three pillars or lamina to three organs. And this point, or better not a point, but an area is called a tendinous arch of the fascia. Yeah, tendinous arch of the fascia. This is the tendinous arch of the muscle. And when we cover it with the fascia, we can get it there. So let's look here. We can see the tendinous arch of the muscle the levator ani, which is covered with the fascia, which is covered, oh, sorry, 
which is covered with uh, the parietal pelvic fascia. And then the tendinous arch of the fascia is this. This is how the vessels and nerves can approach the organs from the wall. Yeah, so you have the wall and then you need to approach it somehow. You have the wall and you need to approach it. And in between is the organ. And here are the vessels to the organ. So it should remind you something like a mesentery, yeah? But of course it is not mesentery as it is not covered, it is not formed by peritoneum. And around is not a space. Yeah? This which looks here as a space is not a space. It is filled with loose connective tissue. So this is loose connective tissue and this is a bit condensed. That's why we are not able to call it a meso. We just call it a pillar of the fascia. And the point here where it's attached, that means where it's attached, Here, that is here, and that's the tendinous arch of the pelvic fascia. We can see on some other figures as well. Yeah? So please do not mix the tendinous arch of the fascia, which is a real 3D structure, with the tendinous arch of the levator ani, which serves only for attachment of iliococcygeal muscle, and it's more two-dimensional fascia. It's just a strip. Okay, don't forget that lacuna vasorum, lacuna muscorum, and obturator can also transmit some vessels and nerves from lesser pelvis and from greater pelvis. Yeah, so they also belong to the topographical sites. So, any question to the topography of, uh, of pelvis? If not, we have break, eight minutes, and then we come back to here. We are going to talk about the topography of the neck in brief. So as for the neck, you can, uh, you can view it from uh, two perspectives. One of them is uh, the planary or two-dimensional view, as you can see here on this figure, just triangles. But these triangles are really not flat. They continue deep into spaces, but the spaces are not called like spaces. In some of them, yes, so you can find the term submandibular space, but there usually do not exist term like carotid space or omotracheal space or clavicular space or so. But the space exists. So for the superficial description, we have the triangles, but then if you get in, you get into spaces within these triangles. But of course, there are some spaces based on fascia and not only on the superficial muscles. So you have to perspective, one is using these triangles and another is using spaces based on fascia. Okay, as for these triangles, you all, you know all these triangles from muscles as we have learned this before. And it is composed here of two regions. One region is the anterior cervical region. Of course, in the midline, you can divide it with an arbitrary line. Yeah, so that's the anterior region. Then we have the lateral region. And then we have the posterior region. The posterior region is not mentioned here as it is formed only by trapezius muscle. Yeah, so that's the posterior region. There is nothing special. And then we have something in between, the sternocleidomastoid muscle, which is sometimes considered as a special region as well. Yeah, having this small fossa, fossa supraclavicularis minor. There is nothing special in the fossa, just the 
cupola of pleura is coming here above yeah and if you can hear how i examine it you can hear how the lung is there if if i knock to this area yeah okay now as for the triangles we have here the supplemental triangle which is not paired and submandibular triangle which is paired of course then this big one carotid triangle based on the carotid artery and then uh, this which is called omotracheal or muscular triangle as you can see it's quadrangular and it's uh, unpaired or triangle when you use this arbitrary line to separate it into two in the lateral uh, region we have the homoclavicular and homotrapezoid which are above the homoclavicular below and homotrapezoid above and then another two structures which are located deep and are not visible in this figure so this is uh, just introduction and now we can use some other figures and go a bit in detail i do not list all the structures which you have in each triangle as you find it in the books but the way how you should approach it yeah so if we look if we talk about the muscular or homotracheal triangle yeah what are the borders sternocleidomastoid and superior belly of homohyoid so it forms the uh, inferolateral and superlateral border and the medial border is formed by the arbitrary line in which uh, lies larynx trachea and the isthmus of uh, thyroid gland what is the content the content is the lobe of the thyroid gland and of course the muscles that's why it's called muscular triangle and this is sternohyoid and sternothyroid muscle and it is also covered by platysma yeah but we have removed the platysma to see all the muscles so that's why platysma is not here but still it exists yeah so you have to think about this during during the approach superficially we find also this vein which is anterior jugular vein and if we remove it together with platysma the superficial layer it is not there anymore okay which other structures are there if we have here thyroid gland for the thyroid gland we have superior thyroid artery well visible the inferior thyroid artery not well visible is hidden behind the gland we have the veins superior thyroid vein well visible inferior thyroid veins running here as the plexus yeah unpaired thyroid plexus and variable in 50 percent present middle thyroid vein draining directly into internal jugular vein yes so this is how you should approach it of course another structure which are visible here are uh, these that means uh, main or large uh, vessels of the neck carotid artery and internal jugular vein another kind of figures you can use not only the schemes which just uh, shows you the structures approximately but uh, such nice figures yeah showing the gland that means the thyroid gland there can be pyramidal lobe in 40 percent of cases so don't forget about the pyramidal lobe here yeah and we can see the vessels approaching so uh, superior thyroid artery and vein yeah but not the inferior thyroid artery that is hidden only this recurrent laryngeal nerve but we can see inferior thyroid veins forming the unpaired thyroid plexus in this case yeah you can see this structure which is superior 
laryngeal nerve, yeah? recurrent laryngeal nerve down, superior laryngeal nerve here. So please, during the study, concentrate on all the structures which you can find in the uh, topographical spaces, just not based on one figure, but check more figures of the same space. If you look into submandibular triangle, yeah, it's not to find the right color to show you as all the colors are used usually. So what are the borders? The anterior belly and the posterior belly of the digastric and the posterior belly is paralleled by stylohyoid muscle. So these are the borders and of course uh, the mandible, the body of the mandible here. The main content submandibular gland and for the gland you should know the artery which goes deep or through the gland and the vein which goes superficially to the gland. So we have the gland, the vessels going through the gland, of course the duct going out of the gland but the duct is hidden behind the gland so it is not visible in this figure. Lymph nodes, some mandibular lymph nodes and if you remove all this you still retain some important structures. Two nerves coming into the tongue. Lingual nerve with the ganglion located superiorly and inferiorly hypoglossal nerve, the motor one. Yeah? And you can see this and it's called arch. So we have something which is called arcus nervi hypoglossi and arch, the hypoglossal nerve. Yeah? And you can see the arch, how the nerve is arching. And this is one of the nice notes or remarks how to, how to find the nerve itself. So there's the submandibular, uh, submandibular triangle. And another figure for that for your own work. If we move to carotid triangle, the carotid triangle is not, the name is not based on the boundaries, which are formed by sternocleidomastoid and the superior belly of omohyoid and posterior belly of digastric, but on the content. The content is carotid vagina with carotid artery, either common or uh, internal, internal jugular vein, dorsally vagus nerve, and ventrally, uh, deep cervical ansa, yeah, which is formed by the superior root and the inferior root, and it supplies infrahyoid muscles. So carotid sheath or carotid vagina is the main content, and there can be some other structures. If you have vagus nerve, you should look for sympathetic trunk. So you have here somewhere sympathetic trunk, and it's here. And you can find uh, two ganglia here, the middle, and the superior, which is somewhere here, is hidden. But if you go deep, you can find it. You can see here uh, the arch. Yeah? We have talked about the arch before, the arch of the hypoglossal nerve, as it continues then into submandibular triangle. And of course, the branches of the structures. So we have here superior thyroid artery, you have here lingual artery and the facial artery as well. Yeah, the beginning of the facial artery as well. As for the veins, you can see the facial vein, and the tributary, that's the anterior division of retromandibular vein. You can see the superior laryngeal nerve here, and of course. Uh, the answer. And the very last one, which is drawn here, but it runs this way mainly because it's a scheme, is the accessory nerve, yeah, supplying the sternocleidomastoid muscle. So you can find it in the superior angle of the triangle. Okay, so this is the way how you should approach, approach uh, the contents of the triangles. Yeah. If you look here, nicely visible hypoglossal nerve arch, uh, branching of the common carotid artery into internal and external, and the branching of the external into superior 
thyroid and the lingual and the facial. And usually here deep, you could find ascending pharyngeal artery and so on. Yeah, so pay attention to all these. And then we have some uh, clinically relevant small topographical structures, which are not so well defined anatomically, but they are clinically important. That's why we, we use them. One of them is we can palpate the uh, tip of the great horn of hyoid bone. Yeah. And of course, we can palpate and see the posterior belief digastric, and in between is a quite acute angle where you can find the lingual artery. And the lingual artery gets here into uh, hyoglossus muscle, but only in the superficial layer. So we can see it, the artery passing in between the fibers here in submandibular triangle but in this small subtriangle, which is bordered by both bellies of digastric muscle as the whole submandibular triangle, but from above by the arch of hypoglossal nerve. And as the hypoglossal nerve submerges here below myelohyoid, the myelohyoid makes here also a border. And the lingual artery in case of heavy injury, especially in, in war medicine. Uh, if you uh, stop here bleeding, then you can save the life of, of the injured soldier. Yeah. So two small topographical spaces based on clinical relevance. Okay, now we can skip from anterior to lateral cervical region. Which is formed by two triangles. They are separated by uh, inferior belly of omohyoid into omoclavicular, which is below, and omotrapezium, which is above. Omoclavicular is smaller, but it's filled with important structures. You can find here subclavian vein and internal jugular vein. Uh, joining the subclavian vein, that means forming the brachiocephalic vein, and the thoracic duct emptying here into the venous angle. Behind, you find uh, the muscle, anterior scalene muscle, this one. And behind is a, a scalene fissure, yeah? fissura scalenorum. So you can find there subclavian artery and brachial plexus. So again, to the, here you have two topographical sites in one spot. If you look at it from anterior view, yeah, in, in a window formed by uh, omoclavicular triangle, you can see deeper located structure, which is uh, fissura scalenorum, scalenic fissure. On the anterior scalene muscle, you can see some structures. And first, we can see here uh, the thyrocervical trunk, branch of subclavian artery, having some branches, inferior thyroid, suprascapular, transverse cervical, and ascending cervical. And the ascending cervical has got here a nerve, and that's the phrenic nerve. Yeah, you can see the phrenic nerve how it continues down. And another structure, a vein. Here can be a vein, and this vein is called vena vertebralis anterior. Yeah, vena vertebralis anterior. So there's a neurovascular bundle, phrenic nerve, ascending cervical artery, anterior vertebral vein. Yeah. So three structures running together, uh, usually not just parallel, uh, but there can be a space in between them, but they have different names. Okay.
And of course, it contains some lymph nodes, supracoagular lymph nodes. Something is running across. So superficially. External jugular vein. Of course, platysma muscle. Yeah? So don't forget that we have some layers. If we move to omotrapezium, what is here? So we can see brachial plexus. We can see cervical plexus and the branches. Transverse cervical, being superior inferior branch. Greater auricular, auricularis magnus, giving anterior and posterior branch. Lesser occipital, occipitalis minor, behind the auricle. And three groups of supraclavicular nerves. Yeah? Medial, intermediate, and lateral. All of them emerges into a nervous point, punctum nervosum, which is located behind the posterior edge of sternocleidomastoid muscle. So many nerves here. The accessory nerve, yeah, it's running more like this, the accessory nerve, supplying not only sternocleidomastoid, but also trapezius muscle. There are some lymph nodes located as well. And deep, we can find an artery running here, and the artery is hidden all the time here. It's branching from subclavian artery, and it's branching inside the scalenic fissure. So here we had thyrocervical trunk, which is, uh, which is branched in front of the scalenic fissure or before in so-called intrascalenic segment. Then inside the fissure in interscalenic segment, the branch here, and I think you all know the branch is called Costocervical trunk. The costocervical trunk branches into su superior intercostal artery and deep cervical artery. So this is deep cervical artery yeah, running here behind all the nerves. Yeah, behind all the nerves. Okay. And the last important structure are deep yeah so now we come deeper and we have talked about the scalenic fissure containing the subclavian artery and brachial plexus and then we have another space here which is called scalenovertebral triangle it is more a pyramid than a triangle as you can see it's formed by scalene muscles laterally Pleural cupula caudale and medial you find the organs. <coughs> the organs, vertebral bodies covered with longus coli muscle. Yeah, so it's more a space than a triangle. And what is the content? The content you can see on the other side. The content is branching of the intrascalenic segment the first segment of the subclavian artery that means thyrocervical trunk the four branches suprascapular transverse cervical ascending cervical inferior thyroid yeah vertebral artery and of course vertebral vein draining here and then the nerves and it's a uh, deep located structure so we have here sympathetic trunk with the ganglia and this is cervicothoracic or stellate ganglion and this branch goes to the heart as well as here is a branch going to the heart as well as here is a branch going to the heart so we call it cardiac branches or cardiac nerves of sympathetic trunk. Don't forget about thoracic duct here on the left side, yeah, turning around here, draining 
and accompanied by some supraclavicular lymph nodes, as we are deep in omoclavicular triangle. So this is the most complicated uh, triangle of the neck. So this is just to show you how you should approach it, yeah, and not to skip any of the important structure inside. And uh, the other part are spaces and fascia. Yeah, as for the fascia, all the time we should start with the fascia which is superficial located. That means the fascia which uh, corresponds to scarpas uh, membranous layer or coles membranous layer of abdomen and pelvis respectively. Yeah? So here, it's again in subcutaneous tissue, it contains platysma and it's a continuation of superficial musculoaponeurotic system of the face which envelops the majority of the facial muscles with exception of the buccinator. Yeah? So it's continuation of the subcutaneous tissue. And uh, yeah, that's it. It fuses with the deep located cervical fascia in the midline. And in the midline, we have something which is called uh, white line. You know the linea alba of abdomen. We have similar structure between sternohyoid, sternothyroid muscles in the neck as well. So the superficial and the deep fascia fuses ventrally and dorsally. Ventrally in this linea alba, dorsally in nuchal ligament. Yeah, so this is the superficial one. And below is a deep one, and the deep one you know that it has got three lamina, three layers. And is this all? So we have the superficial, the prevertebral, and uh, sorry, the pretracheal and the prevertebral, three layers which we have. And you already know them from the muscles of the neck. So you know them like this. We have the superficial, we have the pretracheal, and we have the prevertebral. Yeah, that's the classical concept. But to show you that it is not so easy, there is a new concept, usually not uh, available in the books. That we have the superficial layer, of course, here. Do not mix it with the superficial fascia. Superficial fascia is here and it envelopes platysma muscle. Yeah? So this is superficial fascia, and do not mix it. As this is deep fascia, but superficial layer of deep fascia. Okay, then we have carotid sheath, which is this one. And the layer, which is derived from carotid sheath, is the middle layer. That's this one. Yeah? And another layer is this one, which interconnects the sheathes. So it's called intercarotid fascia. Then we have the pretracheal, and the pretracheal is here. It covers trachea and thyroid gland. Yeah, that's called pretracheal. Dorsally. We have bucopharyngeal, it's here. It covers buccinator muscle and it continues from buccinator muscle to the wall of pharynx and it covers pharynx and the esophagus as well. And then we have the pre-vertebral, which is this. So what is new for you is intercarotid fascia between the two sheaths. Yeah, and that this layer is not called anymore pretracheal, but it's called middle. And pretracheal is shifted dorsally to the organs. Yeah. So this is the new concept, which is much more closer to the truth than the easier concept before, which we had. Yeah. 
you have questions to this, I can just now ask you the questions because this is quite new and uh, you can find it only in scientific articles, not in any of the recommended literature because it's quite new concept based on dissections made in last years. Sometimes you can even find the term fascia alaris, which is a non-preferred synonym for fascia intercarotica. Yeah. So if you meet this, it's fascia intercarotica, but uh, do not use it actively. Why is it used? You mean the new concept because it's more clinically uh, relevant for spreading of, of inflammation. And if you operate, you can see all the layers existing. But you cannot see them on a formaldehyde fixed cadavers. So if you use the formaldehyde fixed cadavers, which we use during teaching, you cannot see all the layers, yeah? But you can see them if you use different layers, different fixation methods like Teal's method, which is used in some uh, some other departments for for science and sometimes even for teaching okay if there are no questions we can move to the spaces which spaces we have okay so we have space which is behind which we call retro we have a space which is in front which we call pre and they contains not much but the most important is the para, the space on the side, as it contains uh, the carotid sheath and other structures. Yeah? So the para space we call parapharyngeal space. And the parapharyngeal space can be divided into two. So if you think this is the parapharyngeal space, if we go up to the skull, it can be divided into two spaces. And it is divided by structure which is called styloid septum yeah this is the base of the skull and this is the styloid septum not only styloid process but also the muscles forming the styloid septum and the parapharyngeal space can be divided into pre-styloid space and retro styloid space so if the base of the skull goes like this, this is then the maxilla with the teeth. So how we call this space? This space we call infratemporal fossa. And the infratemporal fossa is the same as the pre-styloid space. But on a skull, we call it infratemporal fossa. And in human as a whole, we call it pre-styloid space. Yeah? If, if you see just the skull itself and I tell you pre-styloid space, you are lost because you cannot see uh, any styloid uh, septum. Yeah? That's why the term infratemporal fossa is used. Okay, now let's move and look here. Which spaces we can see here? Here are also the fascia. Yeah? This is the retropharyngeal space here. And you can see how the retropharyngeal space now is divided by the fascia. Here it's called alaris fascia, but I told you we call it intercarotid. Oh, yeah, better intercarotid fascia. And the space is divided, the retropharyngeal space is divided into two one and two. Yeah, one of them is called danger space, the other, uh, the retropharyngeal space itself. And this is, this starts to be complicated for you. So it's, it's important for the ENT surgeons and, uh, and so on. So uh, we, we stop the anatomical information here. Yeah, you can go in details then later after the finals if you want. But it is not necessary to know all, all these spaces here. But you can see it is not so easy as, as in books. But the spaces which you should understand now 
is the pre and retrostylate space. Now let's talk about what is styloid septum. Styloid septum are the muscles which are around styloid process. So if this is styloid process, we have some other muscles like styloglossus and stylopharyngeus with different innervation, of course, glossopharyngeal and here. Hypoglossal and dorsal, we have stylohyoid muscle innervated by facial. So you have three stylo muscles, each innervated by a different nerve. Then you have posterior belly of digastric muscle. Yeah. And then you have sternocleidomastoid. Okay. That's innervated as well by facial and sternocleidomastoid by the sewer nerve. So you can see there are four different muscles. They are all covered with one fascia. So it forms a septum dividing these two spaces, which we can see on this nice figure. Yeah. So what is visible on this figure? Upper teeth, yeah, and this is mandible. And the muscles of the mandible is masseter and middle pterygoid. So now you know you are in infratemporal fossa. Yeah? The posterior wall of the infratemporal fossa is the styloid septum with the styloid process and then the muscles, styloglossus and stylopharyngeus ventrally, and stylohyoid and posterior belly of digastric and sternocleidomastoid dorsally. So you have here the styloid space. Now here are the structures of carotid sheath, carotid artery, internal carotid artery. Uh, internal jugular vein, vagus nerve. Yeah, the three main structures of the carotid sheath. Hypoglossal nerve is closely related to superior uh, root of cervical anza. This is hypoglossus muscle. This is superior root, and go down and inferior root. Yeah, superior root and inferior root. So you can see how these two roots run together. And if the superior root is part of the vagina, the hypoglossal nerve is part of the vagina if we are a bit up. Yeah? Then you have vagus. There should be somewhere sympathetic trunk, and it's all the time very dorsal. And the last structure, which is visible here, is ascending pharyngeal artery. And you may know that the ascending pharyngeal artery ascends along the pharynx as far as the skull base, and it gives two small branches. Yeah? One into jugular foramen, posterior meningeal artery, and the other into tympanic cavity via tympanic canaliculus, the inferior tympanic artery. Yeah? These two you know from the skull, now you can apply it here. So ascending pharyngeal artery has to reach the skull base through the retrostyloid space. If you come to pre-styloid space, there is also an ascending artery, but palatine ascending artery. Palatine ascending artery is a branch from facial artery, and it ascends to supply the palate. And you can see this is palatonsil, and palatoglossus muscles, so we are close to palate. Next to it is a vein. The vein is called external palatine vein, yeah, draining this. External palatine vein. And of course, the most important uh, vessel here is the external carotid artery. So in pre-styloid space, we have external carotid artery. In the retrostyloid space, we have internal carotid artery. Okay, question to the styloid 
septum and pre and retrostylate space. This is, I think, the most complicated part of the topography itself. So uh, you can ask. All the other stuff is is not so uh, so complicated. Uh, I can highlight the same here uh, on the figure from the Netter's anatomy. Yeah. You can see the mandible. So the infratemporal fossa is filled with the muscles, with the medial and lateral pterygoid muscle, mainly medial here. And then just next to it, you find this. And this is the styloid septum. Yeah, the styloid septum is not a flat plate, but it was called a bunch or bouquet of flowers. As you can see, it can remind you a, a section of the of the stalks of, of the flowers, yeah, of different thickness. So the septum is not a real thin plate, but it is a complex of the muscles which are joined by fascia and forms a, a barrier for a spread of infection. Yeah? And the dorsally, of course, you find the uh, internal carotid artery, internal jugular vein, and the main nerves. That means the vagus and hypoglossus. Of course, next to it is the glossopharyngeal and it approaches the stylopharyngeal muscle. Yeah? The stylopharyngeal muscle is supplied by glossopharyngeal nerve. Sympathetic trunk, yeah? the deepest structure. And what is not drawn here is the ascending pharyngeal artery, which we find somewhere here in this area. Yeah, the ascending palatine artery would be somewhere here. What is nicely visible here as well is the fascia covering the buccinator muscle coming here, or I can use a different color. It's attached here to the pterygomandibular raphe, and then it continues on the superior constrictor of pharynx here, and we come here. And we come here, and you may remember that we have talked about the prevertebral lamina of cervical fascia. And what we miss here is the intercarotid fascia. It's not drawn in letters. Yeah, as for the new concept. Okay, so that's all for, for today. So please, you can pose the questions. The test will be concentrated on uh, schemes and there can be some, uh, some easy uh, figures from dissections. Yeah? Not aiming at small structures, but bit structures. And of course, it will contain some multiple choice questions and some simple answer question. The number of the questions will be from 30 to 40. We are not now sure how many of them will be there. So if you have no questions, uh, thank you very much for your attention. I will stop recording.